Greetings and welcome to the East Coast Anti-Federalist Show. My name is Brutus. I am joined here today by Kona Bianca. We can be found online at www.ecaf.us. That's E-C-A-F or face spelled backwards. We can be reached with questions or comments at info at ecaf.us. And we want to welcome Kona back. Thank you. Was, was, it a, was it a vacation? It was. I went all by myself to the beach. My husband came down for the holiday weekend Memorial Day to join me, but I had lots of alone time, which I always really value. So okay. I'm all rested and tanned and back in my chair. And she's got her hair down. Uh, it, goes, <laughs> it goes all the way down her back. It's very, it does. Uh, she, she normally wears it up. And, you know, looks like Aunt B or something, <laughs> but uh, surprised me today with her hair in a very long ponytail. Looks good, by the way. Well, thank you. <laughs> so today I have just recently come across an article by Joseph Farah in World Net Daily. And the title of the article is, Does Same-Sex Marriage Warrant Secession? And this is in light of the upcoming Supreme Court decision that will probably decide for everyone in all 50 states and however many territories we still have, whether or not it will be legal to define marriage as between a man and a woman, which will, of course, will affect whether or not it will be legal to run your business, live your lives, run your schools, hire and fire in accordance with your religious beliefs, especially as pertains to the sex lobby, the LGBT agenda. Do we have a right to disagree? To read this article, I will start at the beginning. I haven't yet heard anyone ask this question, so let me put it out there on the table for discussion. Will a U.S. Supreme Court decision declaring same-sex marriage a right warrant secession by some state willing and eager to reclaim America's Judeo-Christian heritage and foundation. You know it's inevitable, right? The fix is in. Two members of the Supreme Court have personally officiated at same-sex marriages. I count three solid votes against it. The chances of reaching five are somewhere between slim and none. I've heard some chatter about civil disobedience. That's all well and good, but I don't see much in the way of serious organization taking place. What I do see is a lot of grassroots concern. I know there are millions of Christians, Jews, and others who would pull up stakes and move to another country that honored the institution of marriage as it was designed by God, a union between one man and one woman. As Jesus said it, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Is there one state in 50 that would not only defy the coming abomination, but secede in response? The rewards could be great. I would certainly consider relocating. How about you? The founders of this country found a place of refuge in America and shaped it into the greatest self-governing nation in the history of the world. Just think what one state could do if it simply stuck to the principles that made this country great. Americans wouldn't have to cross an ocean to rediscover what brought most of our ancestors here. We could simply drive. Are any states so inclined? I haven't heard this question raised by anyone else, so I'm raising it now. We don't have much time before the nine high priests in black robes decide to follow Baal instead of the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We need a promised land. We need an exodus strategy. If not a state, are there any nations in the world interested in a pilgrimage by millions of Americans? It's time to start asking the question. Maybe, you ask, Farah, why is this such a big deal for you? Will it really make a difference in the way you live? It's not me I'm concerned about. I'm old. I'm married. Most of my kids are raised. It's my grandchildren I'm thinking about. It's the next generation. And the one after that. I know what comes next. We're already seeing it. With same-sex marriage, the handwriting is on the wall. With it comes persecution of people of faith. World Net Daily has been chronicling those cases because they tell a story. They send a signal. This isn't just about redefining marriage. It's about redefining liberty. It's about redefining right and wrong. It's about redefining right and powers. It's about redefining government's role and God's role. There's almost nothing bigger than this that I can think of. Though the Supreme Court's ruling that abortion on demand was a right was certainly a contender, that one was something of a surprise. It caught the population off guard. 
They weren't expecting it or thinking about it much beforehand. It took years for it to sink in, and we've paid a horrific price as a people for it for 42 years. So here's the question. Do you want to live in a nation that defines marriage as a union of any two people of any gender? Do you think that will be the end of the story? If it's discrimination to maintain marriage as an institution limited to one man and one woman, why isn't it discrimination to maintain the institution to only two people? Isn't there even a bigger demand for polygamy than same-sex marriage? On what basis can the case be made for one and not the other? You know this is not the end game. And here's the second question. Are there any governors or legislatures out there among the 50 states willing to secede to offer a refuge for the God-fearing? So, that's the article. And I just wanted to open that up because that's exactly what I've been talking about for... It is? <laughs> ...well over a year now, if not more. I, I actually gave a speech on it in 2014 at the Institute of Constitutions event. And while secession was the theme, I kind of realized and have commented to various people either through email, chats, or on Facebook that I'm a little bit disappointed because we hear people on the right, liberty types, patriot types, talk about how, you know, they're not going to obey, they're not going to submit to this tyrannical government, and you can take my gun from my cold, dead hands. Yes. And it was funny, I, I, I watched Red Dawn again last night, and it, it begins with a guy who has that as his bumper sticker on his car, and he's lying there on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> he's got his gun in his hand and this Russian soldier comes up and pulls it out of his cold dead hands. And just, but uh, we're collecting guns and we're fighting for our rights to have our guns. And we've heard a lot with O'Malley running for president. He, he was the governor of Maryland. And not only what a mess he made of Baltimore, but how his gun grab ticked off so many people that that's one of the reasons that people were ready to, to vote in a Republican and governor. And chased a big employer out of this county. Uh, Beretta. 400 jobs, good jobs, yeah. <laughs> gone to Tennessee because of Martin O'Malley. Exactly. Yeah. And so there is a very strong desire for gun ownership. And you know it, it was really refreshing, again, to watch Red Dawn because it's a very patriotic movie. I thought it was made in 1985, but it actually made in 1984. And so it would have been right at the end of Reagan's first term. And while there was certainly some fervor there, you don't expect Hollywood. And it was sort of a who's who. You had Charlie Sheen and Patrick Swayze and a couple other big names who might not be that well known today, but they were they were certainly big names back then who, who were in this movie. And they're, they're driving around in their big Ford truck. And the first thing they do is like, you know, get the gun. Make sure you know how to load it. And, and they're going through all these things that in today's world you wouldn't see in a movie. Or, or if, if it was a movie, it would be like some kind of tough guy, Stallone, Expendables movie where like everybody there is just a big self-contained army and stuff. But this was really more, you know, all these kids were high schoolers, but they all knew how to shoot a gun. You know, even the girls were out there <laughs> shooting, shooting machine guns and stuff. And it was, it was really an impressive thing to see. We have that mentality, but I don't see people who are really organized or planning in such a way that they could actually defend themselves against a tyrannical government. So we'll have a gun. And then when they say, okay, well, and, and one of the things, it, it was actually the Cubans who were the initial invasion force. And in the new version, it's the North Koreans, but the original is so much better. And the Cuban guy goes in and he tells his assistant, go, go get the list of all the gun registrations so we can go around and round up all the guns. And so that's what's going to happen to us. They're going to go around and find all the people who have guns and are law-abiding citizens and say, turn over all your guns. And being law-abiding citizens, we will duly say so. We will we'll grit our teeth and grumble a little bit, but we'll be disarmed. And so there'll be no tools to fight back with. But as I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, I was also at uh, an event held at the National Press Club by Cliff Kincaid and Alan Keyes and Jim Simpson and, and a couple others were there. And I asked each one of them in, in one form or another, what's our plan when the Supreme Court redefines marriage? Are we going to do civil disobedience? Are we going to lie down in the streets? What? And, you know, to 
join this up with another movie I just watched, Selma. You know, the interesting thing about Selma is they, they don't go too in depth into it, but you can sort of see how they had a plan. Mm -hmm. And their plan was not just, let's just go out and rabble rouse and cause trouble. Their plan was, let's go to the places where we'll get the most attention. And then we'll lie down in the streets and then we'll get beat up. And you know what? We don't want to go to places where the police are going to treat us nicely. Right. We want to go to places where the police will beat us up, where the police will sick dogs on us and turn water hoses on us, and then we'll have the media there to cover it, and we'll look like saints, and they'll look like sinners, and that's how we'll win our cause. There was a very concerted plan. Well, we don't have a plan. And so when the Supreme Court does what we know the Supreme Court's going to do, we'll just shrug our shoulders, go back to work get our teeth, grumble a little bit, and, you know, move on. And maybe it's because we don't care that much, but I don't really think that's the issue. I think the issue is we've been domesticated. We, we've been pacified, and we don't know how to fight back. And that's the problem. Yeah, and I think also because the consequences of what's happening are sort of forward in the future, people don't see it immediately. I mean, the Supreme Court will come out, their decision's gonna come out. If it comes out the way Farah thinks it's gonna come out, you know, there'll be a bunch of articles written and a bunch of to-dos, a bunch of talking heads, and then it's just kinda of gonna go away for a while. And so that's why people don't, you know, when somebody's bombing your cities, you realize you have to act now or that horrible damage is gonna happen again tomorrow. But this, the, the damage is so in the future that people don't feel the urgency to act. I think that's part of what explains it. Also, and I think you're right, that they don't know what to do. There isn't a plan. I mean, you see these people being victimized, but they're being victimized one at a time. You know, the baker and the florist, well, the I, jewelry maker. No offense intended, but I disagree. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think if you go back to, hate to, hate to do the old cliche, you know, whoever, do the old cliche. whoever mentions Hitler first. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you could see the evil that was coming in World War II long before it metastasized to this great problem. And even among the Jews, some people were wise enough and they said, this is not going to go well. I'm getting out of town. And yeah. they packed their bags and they got out before they couldn't leave. And then there became a point where you couldn't leave. And the same thing in Russia and all these other places that have these totalitarian socialist takeovers. You, you, you had Jews who were working with the Nazis. Right, because right? they figured they could make nice with them. Right. V is one of my favorite miniseries, especially the original V, which kind of really, it's, it's almost too much just replaying World War II. These Jews, especially the older ones, remember that that's exactly what happened when the Nazis rolled into town. And some of the younger ones, this is, it's, it's so sad because right. it's like Obama watched V and said, that's exactly what we're going to do. We need to get the youth, okay? We need to put them in uniforms. We'll have them walking around and snitching on their parents, right? And that's what happens. I think the guy's name is Daniel and the grandpa's name is Abraham. And Daniel is he, he joins the visitor youth and the visitor youth you know they wear uniforms that are very similar to the visitor uniforms and they even get guns at a certain point mm. and then they're told that sometimes your parents may be planning subversive ideas well just tell us about what they're doing and daniel becomes a snitch on his parents now his parents in general are wise enough to hush up but abraham the grandfather he's he's not giving in and the visitors eventually come in and and kill abraham with that said we'll go to break and we'll be back in a minute
Welcome back to the show. Before the break, we were talking about Joseph Farah's article in World Net Daily about the possibility that the Supreme Court redefining marriage or making same-sex marriage legal would or should or could lead to secession. And one of the things that I think makes this discussion very relevant is where we as a people have come today. Certainly there are folks who write in World Net Daily and Family Research Council and other people who've been involved in the family movement who, who feel this way to varying degrees. And, and that's one of the problems is because there are varying degrees, you're not going to have any consensus. So Joseph Farah, just like myself, is probably looked at as an outlier right now. He's not mainstream. He's, oh, you're crazy. How dare you suggest that, right? You know, and I've been suggesting it for years because, I don't know, I, I don't consider myself to be that visionary or prophetic, but I've thought about this. I've at least been focusing on this issue concentratedly since the year 2000, and I don't see any other way out of it. And that's why it was such a surprise to me when when I got into politics about 2007 or 2008, and civil, civil unions was already off the table, and I hear all these Republicans, well, why don't we just give them civil unions? Civil unions have already been ruled out. Civil unions was ruled out in Massachusetts. Why are you even bringing that issue up? And so we've still got major people running for president, Carly Fiorina and all these people who still want to push the civil unions line. It's like, come into the present, please. <laughs> Learn about this issue, figure out what's already been uncovered so that we can make the right arguments. And what happened in Massachusetts about civil unions? It just went to the court and the court said, this is no good, it's, it's not equal. It was actually California, their Proposition 8 that said, Marriage is for heterosexuals, civil unions are for homosexuals. I think Massachusetts was similar for homosexuals, just not calling it marriage. But just as you said, the court said this is separate but equal. And based on equal protection laws, we cannot do that. Therefore, your law is invalid. And as I've said many times, the legislature didn't go back and pass another law. There is no law in Massachusetts that says two men or two women can get married. It's just a court decision that says it, which is completely wrong. It, it completely violates the whole process of Republican government. Legislatures are supposed to pass laws. If a court disagrees with the law, you can strike it down, but then the legislature has to come back and pass another law. Without that, the court has made law. Yeah. And that's what's gonna happen in a, in a week or so. That's what happened with the Windsor decision. The court struck down section three of DOMA, didn't strike down section two, and to my knowledge, the Congress hasn't come back and passed another law. But everybody decided, oh, Defense of Marriage Act is completely unconstitutional. What about this whole severability clause? You know, they, they pulled it up for Obamacare. Why doesn't it apply for the Defense of Marriage Act? Nobody ever said the entire Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional. They just struck down Section 3, which I think was wrong. But the right thing to do, and I, you know, I asked Michelle Bachman, I asked you know, people who were out there at the time, I asked Steve King and these folks, let's introduce a new law. And why don't we have the new law say the same thing the old one did, mm -hmm. and then let them strike it down again if they really you know, feel like doing it. And maybe we can put in the right president, and he can nominate the right people to the court, and then the court can make the right decision. You know, People just don't want to do it right. They want, they want what the court says to be the end of the argument. And that's how you get your rights stripped from you. That's how you get a Dred Scott decision. That's how you you get things taken away. And so a lot of people in the, in the pro-family movement, Brian Brown and Rick Santorum and all these people are like, oh, well, the only way we can overcome a Supreme Court decision is constitutional amendment. So we gotta have a federal marriage amendment. Well, no, you don't want that. You don't want marriage defined by the national government. It, that, it belongs to the states. That's what the 10th amendment says. And if you believe in what the constitution says, right. I know I have my problems with it, but that's, you know, a side issue. If you want to go by it and you believe that there's a logic to obeying the Constitution, keep with the spirit that the issue of marriage belongs in the hands of the states. But we're not doing that. And so you've got, you've got one group of people saying, you know, they're throwing their hands up in the air, Supreme Court has ruled, let's move on to some other issue. And then you've got the other group of people who are a very small minority who are saying, 
federal marriage amendment is the only way to go. And you don't have people listening to folks like myself who are saying, none of that's going to work for you. If you throw your hands up in the air, you're just waiting for the next issue that they're going to steamroll over you with. Right. If you push for the federal marriage amendment, you're going to fail. And you haven't, neither of you have figured out how you're going to preserve your religious rights. And you have two options. One, revolution. Go to war, fight the war, win, and force your will on those who disagree with you. The other possibility, secede. And in the minds of many, seceding is just like revolution. It doesn't have to be. I've been pointing out examples all over the world where people have seceded, in some cases, peacefully and successfully, and they're still independent nations. In other cases, there was a little bit of warfare. You know, look at the Philippines. There was a little bit of warfare. Eritrea, <laughs> you know, places like that. But at least as far as, the, you know, we can, we can argue about whether Eritrea is a stable country right now. But as far as them being an independent country, that issue is done and over with. You have Ukraine. Ukraine is still fighting. <laughs> okay, uh, Russia has just moved into uh, cities near Donetsk this past week and it was interesting they were they were talking about how many shots were fired but maybe there was only one casualty in the in the whole week which is pretty remarkable what's what, what's really interesting there is i think a new dynamic is coming up in russia you have you know because if you think about it the secession of the ukraine happened when was it 1991 i think so right when all the soviet republics were let go from the soviet union and so all these places, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all the SSRs that we learned about in, in, in grade school are no longer SSRs. They're independent countries. And so for 20 years, they had independence. And last year, February of last year, there was sort of a breakdown in the government of Ukraine where Viktor Yanukovych had to leave office and was forced out of power, and you had this big demonstration in the middle of the town square, the Maidan, the Euro Maidan that they were talking about. And this had something to do with a group of people who really wanted to be a part of the EU. And so they wanted to link the Ukraine with the European Union. And of course, that's not so much in the interests of Russia. So Russia, Russia wants to maintain some kind of hegemonic power over Ukraine. And this somehow developed into a conflict over the Crimea. Mm -hmm. And that, that flare-up has sort of gone away because this area of Donetsk is not in Crimea. <laughs> you know, that's in a, it's in a more central part of Ukraine. And so it seems that Russia is really just taking advantage of the, the instability in the Ukraine and the fact that the European Union is so weak and so incapable of standing up to Russia and, oh, yeah, the United States isn't going to do anything. So, and, you know, of course, we've got a couple of senators out there saying, we should be sending missiles and we should be sending, you know, arms and supporting the Ukrainians and things like that. And so you have this pro-Russian side and then you have this pro-Ukrainian side. And so basically Russia is going to take what they can out of this. And who knows the maps might be withdrawn sooner or later. And that's something, you know, that, that's something that raises a lot of people's fear and concern, but that, that could happen anywhere in the world tomorrow, right? Think of all of the teeny tiny little island nations or the Luxembourgs of the world or, or places like, places like a, a lot of us don't even know exist, like Slovenia, right? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, we know about uh, Serbia and Bosnia and all those other parts of Yugoslavia, but, but where exactly is Slovenia and what are they doing these days, right? And what if that one of their neighbors decided to start just moving in? It could happen anywhere in the world. And the ideal situation, if you were interested in them surviving, would be to turn to the European Union or turn to the nearest country, the nearest big country with power beside them and say, hey, can you help us defend against these aggressors over here? Because we don't have much of a military. And the alternative to that is build a big military and, and, and control. Uh, as I've studied about Rome, you know, Rome started off as a very, very small group of 
people with us with an army who were just willing to go in and invade the next door neighbor and and conquer mm-hmm. and once they got that they made themselves bigger and invaded more and invaded more until the next thing you know they were all of Italy and then they were spreading into Spain and they had most of Europe and were going into Africa <laughs> and and you know how did that happen it was it was a a willpower to move into neighboring areas, but it was also an understanding that you had to be militarized and you had to stay militarized so that somebody couldn't come back and invade you. And how did they lose their power? (laughs) How did they stop being Rome at the end of the day? Was when people like the Vandals, people like the Visigoths came into their society. I think in, in most of these cases, they were not seen as a threat, but once the internal politics of Rome allowed these folks to sit on the throne or to sit in positions of power, they were able to say, well, we're not Roman. And what interest do we have in the future of Rome? And so that's how Rome, Rome lost its Romanness at the end of the day. And not to mention you had all your Germanic tribes and everything, even though they had been defeated, they hadn't forgotten. And as time went on, they eventually all said, Hey, we want our country back. We want our land back. So now Rome doesn't cover all of Europe. <laughs> it doesn't cover North Africa, but a lot of the influence is still there. And so we need to study we need to study all of this, to be quite honest. I really would like to see tea party meetings where we get history lessons. Right. I guess I guess people would rather just give rah rah speeches and lower taxes is gonna save the day. But I'd like to understand the history so that if we have to do this again, we know how. And we know what has worked in the past and we know what has not worked in the past. Uh, we were talking about Selma earlier and how interesting movie because uh, oh, it's partially produced by Oprah Winfrey and, and Brad Pitt is part of the credits too. And oh, just, I didn't know that. Yeah, and uh, he's, he's he, Oprah Winfrey, unlike Brad Pitt, Oprah Winfrey put herself in, in the movie. every major scene in the movie. It's like she, I think Annie Lee Cooper is the name of someone she's portraying. And so she's always like three, three people behind Martin Luther King or something like that. And I have to watch it again because they were saying there was someone who was basically a professional or a, an experienced protester, uh, basically, a, you know, an agitator, a, someone who gets a kick out of going into places and making a scene and if necessary, getting beat up for the cause. And in one sense or another, you know, that's what John Lewis did. It's kind of funny, like, you, you listen, when you listen to the words of the, of the movie, they're kind of unraveling a lot of their plan. There's not enough there to really build a case out of and say, let's just follow this textbook. But there's a lot more there than you get from watching PBS or some, the coverage on C-SPAN or anything like that. They're really telling you how they did what they did. And, you know, so for example, when, when, when Martin Luther King says, I don't want to go to the town where the sheriff, you know, when they did arrest people, they, they treated them nicely. When, they, when, when people were carried off to the ambulances, they, they carried them off in stretchers. They, there was no beating, there was no hoses or anything. And you compare that. I don't know how much of this is authentic, but when they're showing the footage on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, mm-hmm. you know, they've got the guys riding through on horseback. And one guy has a whip. <laughs> one guy has a whip. And he's like whipping the guy. And because the movie had to be altered, uh, as I understand it, the King Foundation has a copyright on all of his speeches and stuff. So apparently they could not use any of his actual words. So a lot of what he says in the movie is not verbatim what he actually said. So I don't know if they generalized it, moved a few words around, tried to get the gist. But uh, but I know like the final speech he gives, he's, he's quoting, you know, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Let's go to break and we'll be back in a minute.
Welcome back. For the break, we were talking a little bit about the movie Selma. And what is really interesting to me about this movie was how it revealed tactics. Tactics that the left is versed in and has a history with. I'm not sure how completely informed everyone on the left is on these tactics. But the real issue, I think the reason why we're not seeing a whole lot of these tactics carried out is they don't need it. Folks on the right stay in their box. It's it's really kind of frustrating to me. We try our best not to make break the law. Mm -hmm. We clean up after ourselves at, uh, at, at our, tea parties and yeah, stuff. And, and, and we even brag to ourselves about cleaning up after ourselves. And we try to do everything by the book. And so one of the things that the movie Selma kind of brings out is that Martin Luther King was a lawbreaker. And the interesting thing about his nonviolent strategy is that it's a strategy. First and foremost of all, it's a strategy. It's not that it's, it's better or it's holy or anything like that. It's just that um, there's a scene in there, for example, when uh, I was talking about how John Lewis was on the bridge. And one of the things that kind of surprised me was after the police had ridden through and beat them up and everything, they turned back and he led the march back to the church. And I'd have been like, I, why am I following this guy? He's retreating. You know, I'd have, you know if, he'd led, if he kept pushing through, that would be something. Or, or if everybody had gotten taken to the hospital, that would be something. But to hear that he led the, the group back to the church, I often, I wondered in the back of my mind, because if I had, I, I, I didn't get along well with our marriage movement because I was not a controllable entity. Mm -hmm. And there was a point in there, I can't remember what the issue was, but some one of the leaders asked me, he said, are you gonna do that no matter what? Are you gonna say that? They were probably arguing about the you know, message because we talked a lot about how, they, oh, it's about families and children and, and every kid deserves a mom and a dad and that was their line. And if you didn't repeat that line, if you deviated and you quoted scripture or you said homosexuality is an abomination or anything else like that, you were on their persona non grata list. <laughs> you, you, were, you were unwelcome. And so I just raised my hand at a meeting and I say, I, you know, I don't think your tactic is going to work. I think we need to approach it in a, in a more militant fashion. And they said to me, well, are you going to stick to that opinion no matter what, even though we say otherwise? And I said, yes. That was the last I heard from them. They didn't invite me to any more meetings. They didn't involve me in any more stuff. And we see how that turned out. Right. It isn't necessarily better to water down your message and, and, and be peaceful, especially when the media is not on your side, the bleeding hearts on, on, on your side. I mean, basically you're trying to, you're trying to put bleeding heart activism against bleeding heart activism and the bleeding hearts were already with the homosexuals. So if I had been there marching with John Lewis and I saw our so-called leader turn around and head back to the church, I'd have probably kept walking the original direction we were going and, you know, I wonder if there was someone who did. You know, the, the media wouldn't have covered it. Lone man completes walk to Selma, you know, 50 miles all by himself. He was the only one not to turn back. That was the story that didn't make it or, or wasn't covered. And so what was covered, at least is, again, because I knew none, none, nothing about this. They didn't even, you know, the coverage I watched on C-SPAN didn't mention it. So Martin Luther King's dealing with his family troubles. John Lewis leaves the march the first day. They get back. Martin Luther King hears about all the violence, flies in the next day, or gets there however he gets there, and then they sort of put out the word, or maybe enough people saw it on TV, that all of these clergy from Massachusetts and wherever else show up. And so there's all these white people in the crowd now, and they've got this, you know, at the, the first time they're marching across and they're all on the sidewalk. And then the second time they're marching off and they're taking up the, the half the street. And you could tell that at least one person was a Greek Orthodox. I didn't see, like I often hear, there's a guy, I think his name is Joshua Heschel, a, a Jewish rabbi. And he's often pictured next to Martin Luther King. Maybe he wasn't at this particular march. But the church I used to go to, my family's old church, celebrates that. Long history there. But I didn't see any <laughs> Jews in, in the crowd. But there were clearly, you know, nuns. There were clearly people from various different denominations. 
And I thought it would be interesting, you know, what were the denominations that were there? Because there was a person, and his name was James Reeb. And although he was born in Wichita, Kansas, and started off as a Presbyterian minister, just looking up on Wikipedia, he grew away from his traditionalist Presbyterian teachings and was drawn to the Unitarian Universalist Church. And he became active in the civil rights movements in the 50s and 60s. And he, he apparently moved to Boston at some point in time. And so when he's asked in the movie, where are you from? He says, oh, I'm from Boston. And I was like, you don't sound like it. <laughs> you know? I mean, sure, the apothecary. Right. <laughs> you know? The bow tie was kind of a standout-ish kind of thing. And I know lots of people wore bow ties just to kind of, just to kind of, they still do today, just to look different than everyone else. But something in me was saying, Unitarian Universalist, that he's got to be, he's got to be. And so it turns out that my hunch was so correct on that. Anyway, so James Reeb was marching along with the other ministers at Selma. He goes out to some diner, gets a bite to eat, comes out. A couple of white hicks, if you will, start throwing slurs at him and... They say the only thing we don't like more than N-words is white N-words. <laughs> and, uh, and then they start beating him up. And the movie makes it look like he dies right there. But according to Wikipedia, he died two days later. And so that, that became a cause celebre also because now you have national or even international media coverage showing dead white people at the hands of these southern segregationists. What was interesting is, and I think this was a little bit before this assault occurred or this murder occurred, is that when King came out to the bridge that day, and again, I, I need to do my research because this is the first time I've ever heard of this, he kneels down, maybe, and then everybody kneels down with him, maybe to pray because there's this long line of police there, but whether it's because there were a whole bunch of white people or what, the head of the police says, troops disperse and they all open the way for the path to go through. Now, what had happened previously in the movie was Lyndon Johnson was trying to convince George Wallace to let Martin Luther King complete the march, and then this whole issue would die down and we could move on to other things. So you have to wonder, was this a result of that? At any rate, Martin Luther King doesn't take advantage of this opportunity. He gets up, turns around, and walks back to the church. And again, I'm thinking, if I was in this crowd, I'd be the guy to say, what are you doing? Let's go. And i just go. But everybody followed him back to the church. This kind of has me scratching my head. Is this, is, is this what the marriage movement expected us to do? To all just be lap dogs and obedient and just do, just follow one leader? And, and I remember somebody saying, hey, this guy is our leader. You know, well, who made him leader? Right. And I'm sure lots of people ask that about King, too. Who made him leader? Right. But they, they followed King back and he gave a sermon of a sort. Some of the things he said in this sermon were powerful, but not in a good way. While rage for violence continues toward the unarmed people of Selma, while they are assaulted with tear gas and batons like an enemy in a war, no citizen of this country can call themselves blameless for we all bear a responsibility for our fellow men. But these aren't the actual words, is that right? Well, see, and that's the thing. Is this, what was her name? Ava? Paraphrasing. Right. Is, is she paraphrasing Ava, Ava DuVernay? I'm saying it with a French accent. <laughs> Ava DuVernay. Are these her words or is she simply capturing what King said and saying them in different in different words. I'm not sure, but it just offended me to no end because uh, once again it re it revealed that King's goal wasn't to complete his mission. It wasn't just to get out there and march. And, and remember, when he's talking to Lyndon Johnson, I thought this was very curious. King is like, black people don't have the right to vote, or or well, they do have the right, but they don't. We're not being allowed to vote, and. Linda Johnson says, well, I can't do that right now. I'm focused on poverty. I need you to help me with poverty. And Martin Luther King stuck on voting. And I'm like, how accurate is this? Because wasn't Martin Luther King part of something called the Poor People's Campaign? 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, wasn't that like one of his major, major issues? Now, I know this is what this was like 1965. Mm-hmm. So maybe he took up the poverty issue after the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Act were signed. But it seems somewhat anachronistic and perhaps opportunistic on the part of whoever wrote the movie to say that Martin Luther King wasn't focused on both. He was just focused on voting. But even if that was the case, the purpose of their march would have been to draw attention to their cause by marching 50 miles and getting to the voter registration place and then make a big scene, probably be turned away, <laughs> right? And and if you've got a bunch of white clergy there with you, then that's going to be that much more impactful. But he he refuses this opportunity. And I think it's at this moment that he makes a comment that Kennedy, he had just learned that Kennedy had been shot, and he just learned that Martin Malcolm X had been shot. And so these things were something not to let their deaths be in vain, mm-hmm. you know. So go out there and, and do your protests so we can one day get the right to vote. And I just thought, man, this is so self-serving, you know. This is so... You, you can't poo-poo it because at the end of the day, they achieved their purpose. But this is just the wrong way to go about things. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't like it at all. I didn't like his strategy. I didn't like the idea. Because I take death and dying very seriously. And when you're going to put your life on the line, you know, it can't be just because, oh, I don't like Sheriff Bull Connor or I don't like Jim Clark and... You know, I want to put a whole bunch of black people on the voting rolls so that we can vote him out. I, I, I think there needs to be something more real and more serious that I'm going to be willing to die for. Or, or more importantly, I'm going to be willing to let other people die for. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know who's going to die tonight right. when we go out there and march through the streets and there's someone yelling at us that this is an illegal march. right? But somebody could die. And their death, oh, that's what it was. He said, who killed Jimmy Lee Jackson? Who killed Jimmy Lee Jackson? Is the guy who died marching in the middle of the night? Who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? Who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? We know a state trooper acting under the orders of George Wallace pointed the gun and pulled the trigger. But how many other fingers were on that trigger? Who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? Every white lawman who abuses the law to terrorize. Every white politician who feeds on prejudice and hatred. Every white preacher who preaches the Bible and stays silent before his white congregation. Who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? Every Negro man and woman who stands by without joining this fight as their brothers and sisters are humiliated, brutalized, and ripped from this earth. Everybody but himself. And everybody but Jimmy Lee Jackson. Real blame he placed on the white people who didn't support their cause, and the black people who didn't do anything, who weren't out there marching with them, basically. I thought that was so evil. Mm-hmm. So it's my fault that you went out there and put somebody else's life on the line, and they're dead. It's my fault. Right. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> okay. You want to go out and die for your cause, go out and die for your cause. But don't put, it up, put the blame on me that you died for your cause. See, the difference between what Thoreau wrote and the way... Martin Luther King carried it out. Is is a world apart. Okay, so keep fighting for freedom and, and keep, keep the, the faith. faith.